Hello, everybody, and welcome to the next in the Hariba series of webinars. Uh, this is Jeff Bodycombe, and I'm acting as your host today. Our speaker is uh, the last bird watcher in Thailand, Willie Hendrickson, CEO and founder of the Rika Group. He's going to be talking about mastering the processing methods of engineered particles. So, I, and Willie does have a story about leaving Thailand uh, just in March at the end of a bird watching trip and being one of the last ones out of there. Give a more formal biography of Willie. Willie is the founder and CEO of the Avika Group. Avika was founded in 1994 as a spinoff from 3M with three people in one site. Currently, the group comprises five manufacturing sites and just about 300 people for industrial, chemical, food, and pharmaceutical contract manufacturing and process development of particulate materials. Uh, prior to starting Avika, Willie worked at 3M as a technical manager for particle processing at 3M's corporate research facility. He received his PhD from the University of Florida in organometallic synthesis and is currently the president of the International Fine Particle Research Institute. He's also a member of the executive committee of the AICHE Particle Technology Forum and an adjunct professor at the University of Minnesota's Department of Food Sciences. He has authored or co-authored over 20 technical papers or book chapters and is an inventor on 50 issued or applied for U.S. patents. Uh, so Willie just has a tremendous amount of experience in particle processing. I've done it for years, and I really look forward to his discussion on processing methods. I'll turn it over to you, Willie. All right. Thank all of you for uh, for joining me today and and listening to me. Uh, we're going to talk about engineered particulates, and what you know. The goal of my talk today is to teach you how I go about figuring out how to make the right uh, decisions on the processing methods used for engineered particulates. And so if I switch to my next slide here, uh, the outline that we're gonna do is I'm gonna give you just a couple slides on the on an overview of Avika because you need to almost understand Avika to understand how I'm approaching particle processing for engineered particles, uh, particulates. I'm gonna talk about what are engineered particles, how do you approach it, general processing methods, some challenges, and then I'm gonna give you three examples, a, a separation example uh, to make an engineered particle, a coding example, an atomization example, and then finally with conclusions. So with that, let's start off and let's find out what, oh, well, let's start off with what Avika is. I, I, I wanna jump right into the engineered particles. Uh, so Avika is a particle technology company that focuses on contract manufacturing. And as Jeff said, we spun off in 1994, we're five companies, a lot of employees, lots of uh, certifications. And you know what we do as a, as a company is we're actually looking for to provide a, a, a vision of leadership and innovation and manufacturing solutions for particle technology. And as I tell people, you know, only you can tell whether my vision and my vision and mission are being followed, with the mission being, you know, to actually supply that sort of innovative manufacturing customer service for the benefit of our customers, our employees, and the communities that we work in. And, you know, and I, I, I hope that we do a good job. I mean, I'm sure some of you will tell me that I'm doing a, a good job or a bad job someday, but I, I think that's what we're trying to approach. The companies that, that we have, the, the sites that we have are, are listed here on this slide. Uh, the top and the bottom slide are the two sites that are in uh, the top and bottom companies on this slide are the are the two sites that are in Minnesota. Uh, our corporate headquarters where I'm located today and another uh, facility down in Cottage Grove that does uh, jet milling. And once again, contract manufacturing is what we do. These two sites are, are primarily industrial. Our three sites in the middle of the slide, uh, Vika Manufacturing, Crisco Food Technologies, and Avika Nutra Processing are bigger volume sites. They're typically food, animal feed, or some industrial processing. And you can see the, uh, the types of things that we do, whether it's spray drying or prilling or microfiltration, uh, jet milling, et cetera. You know, we, we have a lot of different things that, that we do. One of the things that, that as we kind of approach our problems, and, and this is one of the reasons that we, we have a, a, a long-term relationship with Hariba is that we are very dedicated and focused on doing a lot of particle characterization. So whether it's something like size analysis or surface area or flow characteristics, you know, as we approach our problems or we approach even contract manufacturing, we want to know what we're doing, how we're doing it, and making sure that we're actually doing it to the, the way that we think that we're doing it. So over the years, we have we have actually 
added a lot of these characterization techniques. And there are talks that I give that I talk just about characterization because I, it's a very important part of the, the business that we're in. And it's a very important part of the technology that all of us are in, particle processing. If you don't know what you're doing, you really don't have any idea where you're going. So let's talk about just what exactly I consider engineered particles and, and how we, how we are, are looking at this. So an engineered particle in my mind is something that we put a little bit of effort in to making it more controlled. So we might be controlling the size. So you could have an engineered particle that's simply something that's been screened to a tight distribution. You know, the, the more engineering particles that, that you might think about, engineered particles that you might think about, might be particles that have are multi-component or have a really tight composition or ones that have complex structure or shape. I mean, you can imagine where you put layers on layers or you have particles that are specific shapes that are very important to the functionality. Those truly, really are engineered particles. But you know, at the end of the day, I think an engineered particle is also a particle that has a very precise functional property that, that you're trying to get. And so making a, a particle system that has a, a good functional property can be an extremely difficult thing. I mean, they, they might look relatively easy, but you know, to get that functional property again and again and again can be challenged. Other types of engineered particles that, that we've worked on is particles that are chemi chemically or biologically active. So things, uh, you know, we might actually do particles that are encapsulated acids or bases, or something much more challenging is encapsulating and stabilizing uh, live bacteria or enzyme materials and, and trying to keep them still biologically activated. And then finally, the one that, you know, people see a lot of engineered particulates in is controlled release. So a microencapsulated fragrance that has a, a release structure or a profile, you know, a, a size, a melting point release or whatever it is, these are all engineered particles. And you know, each one of these things, e even though there's a lot of similarities between how you make them and how you approach them, each one of them have its own challenges. And this is what I'd like to talk about today is to get to the point where we're going through, you know, how, how we approach this problem of, you know, finding out how to, how to do something like this, how to optimize it, how to make it better. And, you know, hopefully get you to the spot where you can go, yeah, Willie, I don't need to talk to you anymore because you told me how to do it and now I can do it myself. So as far as making an engineered particle, it's all about knowing the trick. It's all about knowing the trick. So here we have on this slide, we have a picture of a man, Carl Friedrich Gauss from the early 1800s. He was a famous German mathematician. And on the other side of this slide, we have my three grandchildren. It's actually Oren, Nora, and Lena Yates. And both of these, both of these groups, Carl Friedrich Gauss and my uh, grandchildren know a trick. And it's a really interesting trick and it's really, what you need to have many times when you're making a particle. So in the case of Carl Friedrich Gauss, Carl Friedrich Gauss, famous mathematician, and one of the stories that is told many different ways, but it basically comes down to when he was in grade school, he was a precocious student, and he kept bugging his teacher about something to do, something to do, something to do. And the teacher knew that this person was very interested in arithmetic, mathematics, and gave him the problem you know, go and solve this problem. Tell me what it, what the number is when you add one to a hundred, one, two, three, four, five, add all, all those up and, and tell me, tell me what the answer is. The teacher figures that uh, Carl would go away, be gone for an hour and come back with an answer. And Carl was back in a minute, literally a minute and handed the teacher the answer. And the answer was 5,050. And the teacher's I don't either knew or, or figured it out that that was the right answer and turned to Carl and said, how'd you do this? Well, it turns out that there is a trick. I'm not going to go through the trick, but the trick is really easy. And once you know it, you can do all kinds of things. So my point is, is I was able to teach my grandchildren and particularly Oren and, and Nora, who are uh, 10 and 12 years old, I was actually able to teach them something that a very famous mathematician came up with. And once you know the trick, you can do just about anything. And what we're going to talk about is the tricks that there are in, part, uh, in particle engineered particulates and 
particle technology tricks. I have some examples here. They just give you a flavor of what some of these tricks are. So one of the first tricks, I'm going to start down in the bottom right corner, how to separate salt and pepper, a science experiment. And this was something that I learned, and, and I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to tell you where I learned this from, but as a, as a child, and this is 55 years ago, I used to read a lot of comic books. And the comic books that I liked to read were Superman comic books. And in there was Jimmy Olsen separating pepper from salt using electrostatics from the from combing his hair and pulling the the pepper out of the, out of the salt using electrostatics and for some reason that that comic strip just kept with me all these years and so you know many years later when it turns out I'm in particle technology it became even more interesting and and useful i actually used electrostatics as one of the ways to to manufacture and manipulate particles I, I, I'm not going to give you an electrostatic uh, example of this this time, but it's one of the tricks that we use. Here's another trick. So if you look at the middle picture, you see a flame candle burning. And if you look up in the upper right-hand corner of the candle, you can actually see a little bit of smoke coming off of there. Now, if we were all in the room together, I would pick on somebody and ask them to tell me what that smoke is. But since you're, we're not in a room together, I have to answer the question myself. And the answer is that smoke is carbon particles coming off of there. And if you actually do measurements of this, and we've actually done that, a typical candle burns at about 50% efficiency, making 50% of its weight into carbon soot particles that are released into your house, and 50% that's turned into heat and light and the, the ambiance that you like. So obviously, you know, so making carbon particles is not something that we want to do, or this is the way people actually make carbon black in, in this type of method, having a bad burning process to produce carbon particles. But look at the look at the picture down here in the bottom. Here's another picture in the bottom left-hand corner. Here's another picture of a candle, and there's smoke coming off of it. But look at the smoke is coming off the candle, and there's no flame there. So when I ask this question, and this is a this is a real interesting observation, and it's a trick to actually know, is that smoke is not carbon particles, but the smoke in this particular case is vaporized wax. In fact, we all know from materials that burn, they always vaporize first, and it's the vapor that burns. And so the way a candle works is it wicks the wax up the wick, the liquid wax up the wick, the flame vaporizes the wax and then it ignites it and, and burns it. When you put the flame out, the wick stays hot enough for a few seconds to actually vaporize more wax. And that's what you're seeing. We've actually used this vapor technique as a way of coating. So we, we've actually set up to coat particles using vaporized wax. But we got this idea from the fact that candles burn like this or candles have this vaporization effect. And actually there are other techniques that, that use uh, vaporization coating methods. Uh, Al Weimer out in Colorado uses a technique called atomic layer deposition to do particle coating. And, and this is just something, these are kind of tricks to know. I'll, I'll leave you with one final trick here. If you know these tricks, it allows you to do things that, that you, that you wouldn't, wouldn't know and allows you to sidestep a lot of things. The last one up here is, this is an example of Kiwi shoe polish. And I use this as, a, as an example, I've used this in many talks over the years, is that Kiwi shoe polish is, is composed of a pigment, you know, carbon black of some sort in this particular case, because it's a black shoe polish, 90% kerosene and about 10% wax. And what happens is, is the wax only dissolves in the kerosene when you heat it up and melt it. And when you cool it down, it crystallizes or precipitates and forms a slurry that gives you the paste. So all the pastes in the world, the greases, the paste, are usually made with this organogelation technique. And once again, this is a way of stabilizing, encapsulating, delivering particles. So knowing tricks like this can help you a lot. So this is, this is a start. I mean, you as an individual or, or me as an individual, we all have tricks that we've learned over the years, whether it's the Jimmy Olsen separating salt and pepper or candles or, or kiwi shoe polish, we need to make sure that we use these and understand these so we can apply them when we need them. Realistically, we all know that we need to go to the literature. And you know, I highly suggest anytime you're posed with a new 
uh, problem that you go to the academic literature. I mean, this is a great place to go. It, it's got answers that have been reviewed. You know that it's right. But I'll tell you, you know, I like the academic literature a lot, but I like the patent literature even better. Number one, it's actually a how-to. I mean, patents are supposed to teach you how to do things. And so when I'm researching a new area, I might read 40 or 50 academic papers, but I might read 200 or 300 patents to actually get an idea what's what's going on in this area. General reading is great. I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to say I like YouTube as a way of finding good answers for particle processing problems. If you want a good YouTube to uh, look at, uh, Google uh, on YouTube how to make marbles. It's an incredible particle processing operation. It's it's absolutely neat. And then I like how it's made. I mean, geez, is there a better show on, on TV than how it's made? I can learn more on that some days. Some days I don't learn anything, but I can learn a lot. The other pictures I have on the side here are examples of just knowing how particle processing is done in general. So I, just to talk about a couple of these up here, two of the most interesting things that I know from a particle processing standpoint is a, one is a photocopying machine. I highly suggest any of you that are interested in understanding how particle technology works is to read a couple pages on how a photocopying machine works. There's electrostatics, there's uh, cohesion in there, there's particle melting, there's particle control, there's electromagnetics, all in, in every photocopying machine in the world. If you understand how a photocopying machine works, you have a really good idea on different particle processing methods that then you can apply later on. The other one I wanna talk about, I, yeah, I, I'm trying to decide which one to talk about because I don't wanna talk about them all, but uh, I have a picture of bread here. Now I don't necessarily think bread is a particle, uh, but the manufacture of flour, if you have another particle process that you can learn, so you can, you can get some knowledge in base and particle technology, I would highly suggest you look at how companies go through flour milling. The separation of the bran, the separation of the germ, the grinding up of the starch, the separation of protein or, or making sure it's in there, the size separation, the color separation, it is a tour de force of particle technology. Knowing different particle technologies that are currently available, whether you get it on YouTube, how it's made, or you just happen to know, these are incredible sources and if you have those, you can be better prepared to do particle engineering, engineered particulates, excuse me. So, you know, after you've done all this, all this literature search, after you, you know this, you, you have the problem in front of you. And the question is, is what do you need to know? As a chemist, I always wanna know what the, the materials that I'm gonna deal with, the raw materials, the solvents that I might be using, whether it's just water or some organic solvent, the, the final product that I have, I really want to know the chemical properties. I, I find it absolutely critical to know things like the melting point, the boiling point, the solubility, the density, the pH, the pKa, the, the KSP, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, these things are important because knowing those properties might lead me to do a process or a manipulation that I wouldn't done in other cases. And, you know, I, I don't have the time today, but I have more cases where just knowing the melting point and the boiling point have gotten us to new novel engineered particles more than anything. I, I really spend a lot of time looking at that. Obviously, if you're making particles, you need to know those functional properties of the of the engineered particulate that you're trying to work with. And once again, the, the raw materials. So things like particle size, and that's not a subtle hint that you need to have a Hariba uh, piece of equipment because God, you gotta be understanding what your particle size is. You might need to know the viscosity if you're in a liquid system. You might need to know the powder flow if you're in a dry system. You know, the zeta potential, you should be taking SCM pictures. You should be, you know, looking at uh, different chemical analyses of, of these things. Those functional properties are absolutely critical because once again, if you don't know these and you're not monitoring them, you're probably not gonna make a consistent engineered particle. Now this, this next one doesn't have anything really to do with uh, chemistry and functionality, but if you don't understand the financial considerations that are going on, the cost of the raw materials, the cost of the processing, the cost of the energy, the, the volumes, the profitability, the, the amount that you're gonna be doing, the uh, rates that you're doing, uh, you know, that, that financially you can have the greatest process in the whole world, but you know, you'll have something that 
no one can afford. And in fact, you know, not to pick on academics, and I, I'm, I'm not sure if we have any with us today. There might be, but you know, academics are really good for giving you exactly a brilliant solution to a problem that you can't afford. And this is, I think, the big difference between academics and industrial people is we are financially responsible. And we have to understand that even in the midst of trying to come up with a, a new material, we can come up with some crazy things, but at the end of the day, we really have to have that financial consideration under control. And finally, the, the last thing, and this one is, you need to know what equipment that you have available. Because wouldn't it be nice if you had every piece of equipment at every size, so you any idea that you come up with, you ready to go, well, that would be nice, but the reality is we all have certain pieces of equipment that are available to us, either that we own or, you know, we can go to a contract manufacturer or, you know, maybe we can even buy. But at the end of the day, there's just some things that we don't have. And so knowing what you're going to use for a piece of equipment and knowing what you have available, this is an incredible important consideration when you're going through trying to decide how I'm going to make this new engineered particle. If you know all of these things, you might be able to make it work. But you know, having said all this, there's what I call some processing dilemmas. You've gotten down the path, you've done some literature search, you've done some good understanding of what the materials are, you you know what equipment that you have, but you you always have these dilemmas that that you're you're on. And you know, just kind of playing off the, the previous slide, it's what I call the available equipment dilemma. You know. This is what's available to you. you you're going to have to figure out how to make it work. Uh, you know, it could be size. It could be, it could be, uh, you know, quali qualifications. You know, you know, you have a spray dryer and you want to, and you want to dry ethanol in it. That might be a bad thing to do because your your dryer isn't uh, solvent rated. Uh, you you have a furnace that can only go up to 500 degrees and you need 800 degrees. Well, you're going to have to figure out how to either make that work or how to get a new furnace to, to be able to do something. The, the second dilemma, and this is, a, I think, a very unique one to particle processing people, I call it the spray drying dilemma. And the spray drying dilemma, by my definition, this is this is my dilemma, is that many times people come to me and ask me to make a particle and they say, you know, I just want you to spray dry this material, or I just want you to grind this material. And the spray drying dilemma is, is probably about 20 or 30% of the time when somebody comes to ask me to do a spray drying processing, the answer is really that it needs to be ground because they, they're dissolving something and then spray drying it to get it to a small size when it would have been easier just to grind it. Or by the the alternative is sometimes people will come and ask to have something uh, ground and the answer is really it should be spray dried because you know they've already dried it in a tray and now they're wanting to, to dry it. Why didn't you just spray dry it? So picking the right piece of equipment and not being pigeonholed, I think is the is the, the right word into what the first word that comes out of out of somebody's mouth or even out of your head. Yeah, I should spray dry this. Well, no, I might want to grind it. I might want to I might want to granulate it. I might want to do something else. You need to always be looking at a different orthogonal way to do it because that orthogonal way to, to do the processing to make your engineered particle might be the best way. The mass balance dilemma, let me give you an example. Right now in the world, everybody in, in the, not everybody, but you know, many people are very interested in vegetable protein to make things like the Impossible Burger. And, you know, separating protein from uh, vegetable sources, separating protein from uh, peas, for example. Typically, this is always done by you take a pea flour that's typically 25% protein, you dissolve it up in water, you centrifuge off the, the stuff that doesn't dissolve or the stuff that dissolves or whatever it is, you're keeping one fraction or the other, and then you end up spray drying of, of this material. Well, the mass balance dilemma comes in two ways. If you really go down this track that I'm going to get that 25% protein out of there and ignore the 75% starch and fiber that you're going to throw away and you have no place to put it, you have a problem. So, you know, it's it's a great it's a great thing that you've really done the best separation in the whole world, but you know, you don't know what to do with that uh, waste material, uh, you'll be buried in it and you'll have a, a process of material that's not going to be financially viable. The other mass balance problem is and, and people seem to uh, forget about this, particularly when you start out with a, a small scale, is that 
you know, I'm going to dissolve something up, I'm going to wash it, I'm going to filter it, I'm going to grind it, I'm going to spray dry, whatever it is, they end up needing to, to use so much water, Just and this is just an example, they end up needing to use so much water that the process might be practical on a lab scale because you can deal with it, but not practical when you're dealing with millions of gallons of water a day that you need to throw away. And so this mass balance, understanding that mass balance is absolutely critical. And finally, the scalability uh, dilemma, and up in here, these two pictures I have are, are two distillation columns. Uh, you can see there's a small difference in size, and what might be useful in one scale is not gonna necessarily be useful in another scale. This is a problem that, that we see with somebody who's figured out how to make some truly unique and wonderful material, and the process doesn't scale very well. And this is a incredible dilemma, because if you could only make it, you would you would have a, a a great a great engineered particle a great material, but if you can't make it because the scaling isn't right, oh that's a disaster. So we're getting close to actually giving you the examples about what what we're really doing. But and I hope this is I hope this is interesting and helpful to you. When I'm looking at particle processing to make my engineered part particles, I'm looking at basically six different process techniques that I'm showing here. Am I going to granulate it? Am I going to dry it? Am I going to atomize it? Am I, am I going to grind it? Am I going to coat it? Am I going to separate it? Now, I think all of you that do any particle processing you know, are well aware that in each one of these areas, there's multiple drying methods or grinding methods, and there's multiple other considerations. And in fact, I think we all understand, even though Willie's put six particle processing tools up here, there's probably another 60 that, that could easily go up here. But the reality is I'm, I'm pretty sure that if you understand these six and understand some of the options within the six, you might be able to do something. So let me give you just a little example using spray drying. I like spray drying. We do a lot of spray drying. For making an engineered particle, it's a great place to start because it's something that is easy to scale up you can make a lot of different materials and you have lots of different options. So, but there are always limitations with everything. So with a spray drying process, typically you're gonna make a particle that's between five and 120 microns. You can make smaller, you can make larger, but really difficult. So if you're, if you're thinking about it, you know, on a spray drying application, you know, you're gonna keep in that, in that size range. Typically you're gonna work with 10 to 60% solids and that's either slurries or solutions. I, you can do lower percent solids, obviously. It, it's hard to collect the powder when you're at very low percent solids. And if you get to two higher percent solids, you, you end up starting to get uh, some challenges with pumping the material. Spray drying, because you're atomizing something, typically you're looking at something that's 100 to 200 centipoise, liquid viscosity. And interestingly enough, just by changing some of the parameters, you can make solid particles or hollow particles. And depending on what you're trying to do, if you make the wrong one, it's you know it's a disaster. If you make the right one, you're a real god. So now th there's even a, a couple other parameters that that I like to look at in spray drying. One of them is you know what atomization technique. So you can see I've got two atomization techniques going on here: a simple two fluid atomization technique uh, at the top, and a spinning disc atomization technique at the bottom. Both of them have great applications, uh, a two fluid atomization or a single fluid atomization. You get a broad distribution of particles and it's easy to do. Uh, a spinning disc, you get a tighter distribution and it can be, but it, it, but it can be harder, more expensive to actually run the, the spinning disc. Now, having said all this, if, if it turned out as you walk through this whole thing and you were gonna actually use spray drying as your particle processing method to make an engineered particulate, the chances are, if you become an expert in this, you will get somebody to come and say, you know, I really want to spray dry and make a 400 micron particle size. Now, the question is, is do you tell them to go away because, you know, I can only do up to 120 microns? Or do you know some of the tricks that are available to actually get beyond the particle size distribution that we're listing here? Let me give you an example because this is actual an actual case where somebody had this problem, and the somebody in this particular case was uh, BASF was has been making and, and still is making a granule that is a carotenoid. So there's a high level of carotenoid in there, and carotenoids are are great antioxidants. They're great micronutrients. Uh, they're also highly colored, 
and they're extremely susceptible to oxidation. I mean, their, their color comes from conjugation and uh, oxygen reacts with that easily and destroys the color. So BASF, somebody at BASF, and I don't know the actual genesis of this. I've actually seen the, the spray dryer that, that this was developed on. Somebody came up with the idea is I really need to make 400 micron particles. And the way I'm going to do this, I have to make it by spray drying because it was the right way to do it. And the guy, rather than say, well, I can't do it with spray drying, he actually figured out a trick. I mean, he was the Carl Friedrich Gauss of BASF for that particular day. And he decided that what he was going to do is he was going to spray dry a gelatin particle with uh, the carotenoid in it. And he was going to spray dry it into a fluidized bed of starch. And what, would, what happens when he takes this big droplet and drops it into starch, the starch actually, the starch particles actually stabilize that droplet so it doesn't coalesce. And the, the fluid bed is actually a drying fluidized bed. So he's doing two drying techniques in one. Number one, he's spray drying, getting some drying. He's taking a big particle that would coalesce if, it, if he let it hit the bottom, stabilizing that, that droplet with uh, starch particles, and then fluid bed drying it and making 400 micron particles out of a spray dryer. We've actually used that technique a couple times, not to make carotenoids, but other, other types of materials. It's an incredible trick to know. It's an incredible technique to know. So finally, the examples. I, I hope you're still with me. I hope so far this has been interesting. I'm gonna talk about three separate examples, uh, cellulose fiber separation. And this was all about getting cellulose to have high enhanced water holding capacity. Encapsulation of omega-3 oils. This is all about protecting omega-3 oils to reduce oxidation and that fishy odor that comes from omega-3 oils. And how to make monodispersed particles, which I'm showing you a picture of here. And this was not for a medical device testing, but it was actually for a bioassay medical device testing. So what I'm gonna do here, and I'm gonna give you a, a spoiler alert on this. These processes had challenges. They had challenges on, on how to think of the, the right one. They had challenges on actually implementing them. And some of the challenges were solved in this and some of them weren't. And so I'm gonna leave you with maybe some opportunities here on, on these three, three examples. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna, in each case, I'm gonna give you a statement of the need. I'm gonna say how we approach the problem and what went right and what went wrong, because you know this happens all the time in engineered particles. And we're gonna show you, you know, give you some examples on how to make these engineered particles and how you can address what the, what the challenges are. So the preparation of cellulose fiber from corn bran. The challenge was, is we have a customer, we had a customer that, that came to us and they have a proven process and they just want us to scale it up and get into manufacturing. So boy, we don't have to do too much on this. We're gonna go to their pilot plant. We're gonna see how they do it. We're gonna scale it up to a, a volume that, that's right. And we're gonna go out and we're just gonna make a lot of money. What we need to do in this process is we need to concentrate this corn bran and get cellulose out. We wanna make a cellulose particle that somehow uh, we're gonna functionalize that cellulose particle fiber to have high water holding properties. So just to give you an, an idea, uh, corn bran is literally the shell of corn that's taken away and thrown away when people are, are trying to extract the starch either for starch applications or to actually make ethanol. And the cellulose that's in corn bran, uh, like the most cellulose, really doesn't have a high water holding capacity. It has the, the ability to hold about one gram of water per gram of fiber. So, you know, that's that's about normal for anything. I mean, that's a, that's about where you should be unless it's, unless it's a highly hydrophobic material, but they, they should be able to hold one gram of water. Our customer was looking to have a cellulose fiber that would hold 20 to 30 grams of water per gram of fiber. So not as good as a super soaker, uh, a super slurper type of material, but you know, much better than cellulose. And so the solution was, is our customer and us, we all started at the same spot and we looked at what the composition of the corn bran was. Corn bran, because it's, you know, they, they've taken the starch out, there's still a little bit of starch left, a little bit of protein left, some, some fats and oils, a little bit of ash and some, some water. 
those things we got to get rid of. We, we got to get rid of those. But what we really want to do is we want to take the fiber component of this, which is about 80 to 90% of the product, and take the cellulose and it separate that from the hemicellulose and the lignin. Now, just to give you an idea of what we're looking at, if you look in the bottom right corner, what you see is what a cellulose fiber actually looks like. They all have a hole in the middle. Fibers, cellulose fibers are used to transport water in, in plants. And so there's always a hole that water is being uh, transferred from. Cellulose fibers are also there for, for rigidity and strength. And the rigidity and strength comes from a three layer structure of cellulose fibers wrapped around the central core, the central lumen. If you look at the SEM photo here on the, on the left side at the bottom, that's the structure of the cellulose microstructure. And what you're looking at is two different layers. One layer that, that is going, you know, basically up and down and the one layer that's basically going side to side. These are the two different layers. And so what you have is you have this tightly engineered particle that you're trying to separate out all this stuff and actually make the final engineered particle that has that highly water holding capacity. So the process that, that you do to, to do this, it's all simple steps. We're gonna slurry the, the corn bran and water and we're gonna add some enzymes to digest the starch and the fat. So we add some protease, some amylases, and we, you know, boom, that stuff gets digested. And now we centrifuge that material and we separate out the fiber component. To that fiber component, we redisperse that in water. We add caustic, and caustic is well known to solubilize the hemicellulose and the lignin. And now basically we're taking that glue out of that, out of that fiber structure and we're actually separating it out. And if you look down here at the pink picture at the bottom, this is a, a, a poor uh, optical image of cellulose fibers that have been separated apart in our process. And the top image is what happens after you dry that solution and you get this mat of fibers that when you redisperse it in water, it now has this high water holding capacity. It's a simple process. And in fact, when we talk to our customer, that's exactly what we believe. And so we put this together, we built some big centrifuges, some spray dryers, some, some uh, uh, other pieces of equipment, some heaters, you know, brought in the caustic and the amylases and the proteases and did all this stuff. And oh my God, did we have a problem. So we're making this incredibly interesting engineered particle by separating and modifying the process. We had poor yields. We had inconsistent process, absolutely incredibly inconsistent. And the water holding results were incredibly inconsistent. So we go back to our customer and we talk to our customer about this. And our customer's perspective is we don't know what we're doing. And that, that actually might be true. That's entirely possible that we didn't know what we were doing, but oh my God, we're, we're into this for millions of dollars right now and we don't have a process that works. So we kind of, we now got into this part way, whereas if we had kind of entered it ourselves and developed this process, we would have had a better understanding. But we went back and said, all right, what the heck's going on here? So the first thing we tried to do is understand what's going on with this process. Went back to the literature, went back to all these tricks that we had. And basically when you handle fiber, you wanna to go to the people that handle more fiber than anybody. We went to the paper industry. How did the paper industry do this and what was going on? And the paper industry gave us a really good idea what was going on with the water holding capacity. And, and there's some interesting tricks that are done that I'm, once again, I'm not gonna talk about, but you know, we understood what was going on and we, we figured out how to optimize that to get consistency. But the second thing we did is we thought, what is going on with this stuff? Why is this going wrong? Our customer is telling us this is 100% cellulose, and yet we're getting these chemistries and yields and processing that's inconsistent all over the place. Maybe we should analyze and understand this. The problem with analyzing fibers and cellulose and, and carbohydrates, polysaccharides, is they all look the same. I, and I don't have a structure here for you, but polysaccharides, all those sugar molecules together. You know, I'm a, I'm a chemist and they, they, it still makes my eyes spin in my head trying to tell the difference between 
cellulose and hemicellulose. I, I think I can do it, but I, I, I could probably pick the wrong structure from one time to another. And if it's difficult to see it on paper, it's difficult sometimes to actually do the analysis. One of the things that, that we knew is that there was a really nice liquid analysis, a, a, a chemical analysis that took about a week for every sample. And that really didn't fit too well with us. So we looked a little bit more in the literature and what we found out was that there was a interesting way of analyzing carbohydrates using uh, thermal gravimetric analysis, TGA. And in this particular case, what you, what you find out is each polysaccharide uh, has a different decomposition point. And if you do a very slow decomposition, uh, as shown here, you can see the drop in the, the amount when the cellulose actually uh, decomposes. And if you uh, take the derivative of this, you can actually get a peak and it's a very sharp peak. In fact, as a chemist, it almost looks to me either like an infrared analysis or an NMR that can actually see a positional uh, definition of cellulose and hemicellulose. And I'm not sure if you can see the images, but the decomposition point of cellulose is about 300 degrees centigrade and hemicellulose is about 270. So, you know, we can see, you know, what's the relative ratio of cellulose hemicellulose. And in fact, we did this and we did this with a number of samples and we developed a lot of really interesting techniques. In fact, I'd like to give credit to Paul Verbanek, uh, who works here at Avika as a person that really developed this, uh, this technique for us. I mean, it was known, but he refined it down to the point where we got these very good spectra. Uh, if you look at corn bran, this is the starting material. Here's your peaks at about 270, a, a little, they're, they're off a little bit. Uh, th there's a lot of story here to tell. I'm not gonna tell, but you can see there's peaks at about 250, 260 and cellulose peaks at 325. Now our customer, was absolutely positively convinced that he was getting 100% cellulose out of the material. So when we evaluated the process material, what we ended up with something that was about 75% hemicellulose and 25% cellulose. And in fact, we hadn't changed the composition at all. We had washed away a lot of material, but we hadn't changed the composition of the stuff that we collected. In this particular case, this was a classic case of our customer and us, both of us to start with, not knowing what we were actually trying to do. We didn't understand the chemistry and we didn't understand the process to begin with. But now that we had this ability to analyze, we had to develop this analytical technique, we could actually solve the problem. The, 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 the problem is, <laughs> the problem is, is our, is our customer actually decide to hell with it? They weren't gonna do it anymore. And so we had this wonderful process to make this incredibly good fiber. We actually even knew how to make the yield go from 25% up to 80% and the customer walked away from it. One of the sad parts about engineered particulates is many times, even when you have the solution, you don't get to actually use it. And this was one of those cases where we finally got it right. We understood how to make every bit of this right needed knew how to make it even at a higher concentration and then they walked away bomber well let's talk about a different one this is this is a much more interesting one i like this one a lot and and you know well we're not going to be successful here either but i'm going to tell you the statement of challenges is there is no known method for protecting omega-3s from oils from oxidation so if you go and buy a a sample of uh, omega-3 oil that's been encapsulated micro encapsulated not in a gelatin cap but micro encapsulated it's beautiful so long as you don't expose it to, to air because the air will go right through that, that shell and actually oxidize the oil and now you have a fishy smelling oil. This, this diffusion of oxygen through a cell wall is something that is just incredible. So microencapsulation really works, but it doesn't work very well sometimes. What we did is we, we approached this problem by let's consider biomimicry. And in this particular case, I'm, I'm gonna use the solution is a corn seed. So corn, a corn seed, this is a cross section of corn seed. And basically the oil for, for any seed is in the embryo. And the oil is a high energy source of food for the plant to get going. And so that's why there's, there's oil in these uh, materials. And it's stabilized in a corn seed or a chia seed or a poppy seed or whatever it is 
and it can be stable for years. So nature has figured out how to stabilize oils. In, in the case of omega-3 oils, flaxseed and chia seed have, have a lot of it, and it doesn't go rancid, and it doesn't go rancid for years. And yet when we make a microcapsule, typically, uh, we have maybe 45 minutes before it starts to go rancid. I mean, it's that fast. So what we did is we looked at this seed, and, and if you look at it, there, there's, it might not be obvious here, but there's many layers. There's a bran layer on the outside. There's a wax layer on most seeds. There's some carbohydrates. That's the uh, endosperm, the, the, uh, the starch. There's different sort of structures within here. And in fact, all oil is held in these very small vesicles that are comprised of phospholipids and particular um, uh, proteins called oleosins that stabilize the phospholipids. And so what we thought is let's create a mimicked seed. And if a seed can handle it for years, maybe we can make the same thing. So this was a, a real thought about looking to where somebody might have solved it, you know, that nature has solved this, this problem. And can we come up with a structure and a process to actually make it? So our proposed structure is to have our, our oil core have that organelle shell on the outside, that's that oleosin phospholipid shell, put some, some stabilizing uh, alginate on the outside, put some carbohydrates with some protein and fiber, and finally coat it with a fat fiber shell. And we actually went through and made this particle to, to, actually, to actually come up with a microencapsulated oil. And in one sense, we were successful because we were, as good as the standard methods. The, we were as good as industry standards. We weren't better. So technically we actually made the structure. Uh, from a functional standpoint, we were as good, but not as good as seeds, but as good as the industry standards. And so, you know, we were, we were a success. I mean, I'm gonna call us a success in coming up with the realization that there is a structure out there that stabilizes omega-3s. We actually made a structure that tried to mimic it as, as best that we could in a true engineered particulate multi-layer structure, but we didn't quite get there. And we, we think that because of how much time we were able to put into this, we didn't have exactly the right materials. I mean, we chose some materials that we, were, we felt comfortable with and some, some processes that we felt comfortable with, but we probably needed to optimize that. And secondly, we probably needed to optimize this oleosin stabilization on the inside because we really felt that this oleosin structure was one of the key components of why a seed is stable, but we weren't. So, you know, I, I think that there's still a solution out there. We failed in the in the fact that we didn't go into commercial production with this, but we I like to think we succeeded in coming up with a very interesting multi-layered structure. And the concept of using uh, biomimicry was was well worth it. So the last one of a highly engineered part particulate, the last example, the, the statement of challenge is we had a customer that wanted to make four millimeter monodispersed beads to be used in a bioassay end use. Needed to be sterile, needed to be extraordinarily tight size, and not only had the the size have to be right, but the weight had to be exactly the same. And we had to minimally waste raw materials. So, so just think about it. this last one here. If I was just able to grind up material to you know, whatever that size and weight distribution is for four millimeters and however many milligrams, I can't remember, maybe it was 30 milligrams for that, that size bead, I could just grind it up and throw away 99% of it and finally get the, the, the right size and weight for, for all of these, and I'd be okay. But you know, I couldn't do that. I, we had to have a way to make this. For us, the solution was prilling. And I'm gonna explain what prilling is in just a second. Uh, and we're gonna do it in a different way than people normally do it. We're gonna do it in underwater formation and cooling, and you'll understand why. And we needed to develop a new atomization method. So, you know, we, we had an idea, you know, we, we knew how to do some of this, but we had to really expand the, the process windows in this underwater and atomization process to get this tight distribution. So prilling, prilling is a making beads directly from a liquid. So typically what you do is you'll make it from 
uh, meltable materials. So hydrogenated oils, waxes, polylactic acids, phytosterols, materials that will melt and have a low viscosity. And low viscosity is very critical here because what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this melt. So imagine that we're taking candle wax, we're atomizing it, and then we're cooling it down. So we're not drying it, we're just cooling it down and we can make beads that, as you see over here. These are beads that we made for uh, a cosmetic application where they, you know, different colors are, are important. Not necessarily to me, but it was to the, the application. And, you know, this has some really neat uh, properties. It's nice, nicely spherical. You know, you're making it in the 10 to 2,000 microns, you know, 10 microns to 2 millimeters. And you can make a lot of it if you want. You can make a little of it. So it's a really interesting process. But the challenge is in prilling, typically we're atomizing at the top of a chamber and we're allowing that liquid droplet to fall, cool, freeze, and by the time it hits the bottom, it's solid enough to bounce and not splat. Obviously, if it splats, we don't get a round bead and we don't get separate particles. So the bigger the bead you get, the taller your tower gets. And in fact, to make a four millimeter bead, I'd need a tower that was about 100 feet tall. Now, I don't have a 100 foot tall tower. That goes back to my equipment dilemma. I don't have it. So what am I going to do? In this particular case, rather than build a big tower and try to do this, what we did, well, and here's, here's just an example of spraying and collecting. I, we don't even need to look at this here. What we did is we took melted wax and we atomized it in water. So it's hot water down here. The beads float to the top and we put cooler water up at the top and they freeze and we collect them from the top. Kind of a lava lamp application where you know we're using that lower density and rise. If we were actually using a wax that had a higher density than one, we'd have prilled from the top, we'd have let it fall to the bottom and we'd collect it from the bottom. In this particular case, making four millimeter beads is not easy because it's, you have to have a very special nozzle. So we had to develop a special nozzle also. So we got a special nozzle to develop that gives us uniform beads that can operate underwater. We have to get to the right size. We have to keep it hot enough to start with because if we cool it down here, we'll just freeze our nozzle and, and we'll be done. And if it's too hot up here, we'll just have liquid droplets that are gonna all coagulate together. So a, a real balance of temperature and atomization to come up with this. So let me show you what it actually looks like. So this is a this is a a, a picture of it actually of the process of what that simple diagram looks like in the lab. So a couple things about what, what we're doing here. What's happening is, is we set this thing up and it actually worked brilliantly. Uh, you know, even though we have a little bit of agglomeration going on here, this was one of the first uh, times that we did this. And so what we, what we have here is we were able to produce beads like this that have that four millimeter diameter and extraordinarily uniform. I mean, we had this, we had this down where, you know, it was plus or minus a milligram in weight. You know, the size distribution was right. I mean, if we actually spread these beads out on a, on a screen, you could actually see that they, they hexagonal close pack, a, a real good indication that they're uniform size. The challenge was in this second picture over here. So we made the right beads. We had a process to do it. We didn't need a hundred foot tower. We were actually able to develop that. But you notice here the beads, you know, they all look kind of uniform, except for these two that have holes in them. And what those holes are is we actually had water inclusion in this system. So the atomization process, and, and in fact, as we really thought about this and considered what we had been doing, we had been doing prilling for years and years and years, we ended up getting holes in lots of beads. Most of the time it was with air. The prilling process isn't just an atomization of a droplet, but in that atomization process, 
there's some enveloping of air. It's kind of like a gulping sort of situation uh, that we didn't fully appreciate. And in this particular case, that water inclusion was a bad thing because the customer couldn't afford to have water in their beads. And so we actually worked out a solution even to this problem is that we actually vacuum dried the beads and it worked wonderfully. We we're actually, you know, very difficult to do because we can't dry it too high a temperature, the beads will melt again, but we were actually able to get the water out. But by the time we had that all figured out, the customer went on to another technology due to timing. So even though we were, I, I think at the end of the day, you know, it was a great piece of work. The, the uh, engineers and researchers did a wonderful job on this. We had a, a process that has lots of opportunities, but you know, the timing wasn't right. And we had that one glitch in the, in the system that we could fix, but wasn't something that we truly appreciated when we started. So with all this said and done, I'm at the end of my talk. I haven't, I think I've talked exactly the right amount of time. Uh, knowing the tricks and applying them are critical. I mean, it's all about knowing the tricks and multiple methods should be considered for every problem. And I can tell you, it's hard to analyze and to know too much. I hope you enjoyed the talk. I hope you give me a call if you have some questions or comments. Uh, send me an email, and I'd be happy to um, I'd be happy to answer any questions, or maybe I can answer some questions now. Jeff. Yep. Yep. So uh, there are a few questions that already come in. Uh, let's see. In the um, yeah, I guess it's in the peeling process. How do you control the aggregation? Uh, typically, t uh, that's a that's a good question. Typically, we don't have aggre aggregation in a prilling process. I mean, we're doing this at uh, such dilute uh, methods that that we don't have that. But you know, mm -hmm. if if you do it too hot, you can actually get uh, uh, aggregation. But the way that we do it, we we know how to control that, and we don't typically see it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you remember the melting point of the wax and the temperature of the process? Uh, I believe that wax was about. Uh, 80 degrees centigrade. I, I, I could be wrong, but you know it's easy to do waxes that you know range anywhere from about 60 degrees centigrade. If you get too low, it's hard to freeze them. Uh, mm -hmm. And I believe we've done uh, uh, materials not underwater prilling, but just other prilling, where we've done materials that have melting points as high as uh, 200 degrees centigrade. Okay. Uh, next question: Does it not? Uh, is the nozzle fluid flow intermittent to allow the particle form formation in prilling? Uh, typically in prilling, it's not. In the nozzle that we developed that, that we just showed you, it was an intermittent flow. So we, that's, how we, that's how we controlled size distribution. But, but typically in a nozzle, you're just having continuous flow and now you're controlling it by either single fluid or two fluid atomization methods. Okay, here's a sp specific one. What rate do you think you can prill peg 8,000 particles with a two millimeter diameter? Ah, uh, you know, I, what I don't know is what the melt viscosity of peg 8,000 is, but let's pretend that, that it's within the range that I can handle. Uh, we, have, we have prilled peg in the past, and to make a two millimeter particle in the right setup, uh, we've, we've prilled two millimeter particles uh, at a rate of uh, 2,000 pounds an hour, and other people in different types of setups can prill at a two millimeter particle at a rate of five to 10,000 pounds an hour. So there's lots of opportunity for high rates if that's what you're interested in. Okay, so we can make lots of them. And how long does it, does it tend to take to find a final solution for, uh, for each case? <laughs> you know, that I, I'm, I'm laughing not because it's a bad question. I'm laughing because it's a great question. You know, it, it, at the end of the day, when, when, when somebody comes to us and asks for these things, some of the solutions, because we've done this so many times, and not, not just me, but the people here at Avika, we've done this so many times, it's almost like Malcolm Gladwell and Blink. You can just look at it and you know you know the answer instantaneously. So the, the solution, to, to get to that solution, might be as quick as the discussion itself. I mean, it, it definitely happens. But some of the, the solutions like the micro-encapsulation of the omega-3 oils, well, we worked on that for six months and we didn't get the answer. And we probably have, if we ever, if the answer is possible, it would probably take, you know, a lot more time to get to it. So. 
instantaneously to you know a long time. How about that for a, for a good answer? That works for me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can underwater prilling produce 100 micron particles? And can the water include solvents that dry onto the surface of the particle? Wow. Uh, that's a that, that's a, that's a great question. The answer would be yes. I mean, I could see a way to do it. Uh, I could see a way of adding, I mean, what, what your question, you know, so number one, can you get a smaller size? And the answer is yes. Uh, and you would only do that because of that, you're trying to put something on the surface at the same time would be my guess. Otherwise, you know, 100 micron particles, we just do that in air. But if we if we need to add something at the same time, if it if we can get it miscible, soluble, emulsified in water, and it can actually interact with that surface. The answer is that we probably could, you know, add different things and come up with a, a new way of producing, you know, a particle, an engineered particle in a one-step process. It's, it's a it's a very good idea. I like it. Yeah, I'll add as a comment because I've seen your your plant that uh, Willie has some other tricks for for adding to particle surfaces that are kind of unique. I'm thinking of your mace, mace process, if I pronounce it. Oh yeah, it right. yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. I, you know, we, we didn't we didn't show you everything on on this slide or this 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 presentation. In fact, there's so many other tricks and processes and everything that you know, lots to, lots to consider on on any problem. So, speaking of tricks, uh, someone's asking if you, do you think having a reducing agent in fish oil would help with omega three oxidation, and if so, wow. which ones? Well, I mean, I mean, you know, in in one sense, people do put reducing agents in. They're called antioxidants, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so, you know, people put uh, uh, typically they'll put BHT or BHA into the system. The interesting thing about that for omega threes, if you put too much of it, the antioxidant, the BHA BHT, can become what's called a prooxidant. So, you know, th there are things to add. I mean. Depending on the material, if you're going to eat it, you know, add something like BHA, BHT, commonly added, but it doesn't necessarily solve all the problem because no matter how much you add, you eventually run out of it, and then the oxygen still keeps on coming. Yep. Okay. Well, I think that kind of wraps things up for now. Uh, once again, if you have any questions, reach out to us online or call Willie at the at the phone number and email that is uh, on the slide there, and we'll see if we can help you out or provide some more answers. With that, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Okay, thanks, bye for now.